really happy to introduce our final 30 minute talk speaker of this year's event. Uh, we've already embarrassed Dave, so I'm going to now take some time to embarrass her a little bit. This is a. You can try. A place of, of love. It's a beautiful place of love. Um, she is joining us here from Minneapolis. She is one of the co organizers of the DevOps Days Minneapolis conference there, as, one of the, as well as one of the core organizers for DevOps Days globally. Uh, she helps organize uh, the Minneapolis DevOps and AWS meetups. Uh, obviously a very awesome person who cares a lot about the communities that she's a part of. She and I actually met here two years ago. We were both giving Ignite talks at DevOps Days New York 2013, and I decided to go talk to her because I thought she had awesome hair. She's not part of a conspiracy of pink hair thought leaders because that is not a real thing. It does not exist. There, there's definitely no conspiracy. No conspiracy. So, everyone, please welcome Bridget Cromwell. Hi, folks. Um, so, now you're realizing why I was very excited when Fanta prepared the. Um, did I get your name right? right? Well, anyway, I think her name was. Fanta, pro uh, proposed the uh, remote ops work um, open space yesterday. So I was like, excellent, research for my talk. I did go back after the after party and changed a bunch of my slides. So hey, contributed, reiterated, it was great. Um, but basically, yeah, uh, I'm going to talk about the doing the remote work thing um, in, a, in a DevOps sort of way. Um, it would be great if I turned on my audio visual disasters. Actually, not that bad. This time I just forgot to turn it on. So who am I? Bridget Kramout. Catherine already introduced me, so you probably know most of this stuff. Uh, probably the one thing that we didn't talk about was I do co-host a podcast, so you can go check out ArrestedDevOps.com if you want to see people like Catherine and Jason and MCR showing up on there from time to time. Um, and uh, yeah, you can find me on the Twitters. Um, if you've been following the DevOps Day hashtag, you probably noticed that I, I like the Twitters. So I think my, I'm pretty sure my coworkers all mute my conference hashtags during the conference. <laughs> but, um, so yeah, I work in a place called Drama Fever. We're a streaming video uh, platform, really. But we started out as a streaming video website. Um, the first uh, the first episode of the first show, like episode one or you know show one in the Drama Fever database, is Coffee Prince because we started out just streaming K dramas, Korean dramas, and um, we've expanded to a lot of other countries and a lot of other. Um, you know, languages, we subtitle it all, and most of our customer base is in the North American market. So from an ops point of view, we don't necessarily need to do a follow the sun thing in terms of like, you know, live support or whatever, since most of our customer base is in, you know, a fairly a North and South American band of the globe. Um, but we do actually also run a video platform now. So we run a couple of sites for AMC. and. Uh, that we're on the Sundance documentary site, and um, uh, Shutter is a horror site that we have coming online sometime in the next month, I think. And uh, so, at that point, you when you go from like single site to multi site, uh, you definitely want to hire more people. And I mean, who here works someplace that's hiring? Yeah, they, so almost the entire room raises their hand, and you might find that you can't find people to hire in your local market. And if you can, if you have the ability to hire people um, who maybe live outside of a limited geographic area that may have housing density problems or maybe super expensive to live in, you might be able to hire more people. So it's just a good strategy if you can make it work. But a lot of organizations think, well, how can we possibly make that work? I know in the open space yes, yesterday, a bunch of people said they wish that they could be in a remote friendly environment, but the, the company doesn't know how to make it work. Um, so we have, I'm not going to go into a lot of detail on our staff because this isn't that talk, but we have all of the, you know, Dockery goodness and whatnot that, that uh, you know, uh, Bajit Lib didn't put in his talk, and then he works at Docker. Um, but we also have um, a, an office in New York, our, our main office. It's actually not where most of the tech team is. Most of the tech team is in Philly, but our main office is at 72 Madison Avenue. And it's a, it's a wonderful space. And if I wanted to go work there, I could. I could walk over there really easily now. If I wanted to walk over there from where I actually live in Minneapolis, um, Google Maps tells me it would take 365 hours, which sounds like a really long commute. I don't know about you, but I'm not really into commuting. So I don't actually want to do that. Um, and so 
not having to go into the office becomes really valuable if you would like to work someplace that is nowhere near your office, or live someplace that's nowhere near your office. Um, we do have co-working spaces in Minneapolis. This one's in the old grain exchange. It's a, you know, 40 foot ceilings and you know, wood floors, and it's a really fantastic space. I go there approximately one day a week, depending on whether or not I'm in town. Um, I work out of coffee shops a lot. Uh, the, the guy on the far end is looking at me, and he was like, is this gonna end up on YouTube? And I was like, no, <laughs> you're not starring in a video. Um, I work at home a lot, and it's, it's amazing how your cat ends up deciding exactly where to hang out when you're sitting, when you're working on the couch. Um, and so you think, okay, how does this work? Because that sounds like you just hang out a lot of places. How do you actually work? So whether or not I'm in any of those places or not pictured, airplane, the GoGo in-flight Wi-Fi is terrible. You can sort of work, but it's mostly terrible. Um, but what work looks like is it's in Slack. It's in GitHub, both issues and pull requests. It's in Google Hangouts, usually scheduled, but sometimes ad hoc. And we do use a lot of Docker, that's the last mention of Docker, but we do use a lot of that because it's really nice for basically a lot of consistency. There's literally, I don't think I've ever heard it. Well, it's, it's very rare to hear somebody say, it works on my machine, because it's like everyone's pulling the same containers. So we at least have that kind of consistency where you don't necessarily need to go over to someone's machine to try to figure out what's going on. Not, not to say that you don't end up screen sharing with people sometimes to solve things, but. Um, and. I assume that uh, because we are, I had to throw this picture in there because we are right here by Times Square. I didn't realize we were gonna be this, time, this close to Times Square. For some reason, Google decided to advertise for us in Times Square all of December, it was fantastic. It's like, okay, Google, thanks. Um, but we don't usually put out information that way. Like how we actually disseminate information on our team is any kind of ad hoc discussion, whether in person or in Google Hangout or whatever that you have, or in Slack that you have, it, it makes it into the GitHub issue, or it didn't happen. So the single source of truth that we were talking about yesterday for us is in GitHub. Um, we do have teams that use like Pivotal Tracker for different things, and you know they use other things for very specific projects. But the single source of truth is in GitHub, and the single source of communication is, that you're expected to be paying attention to if you're at work is our tech channel in Slack. Um, we have a lot of channels. I mean, that's that's not the only channel. Uh, I, I love Slack, so I wrote haiku about it. We need it. But um, this is just a small sampling of our channels. Like we have an app-specific channel, but it's a public channel that anyone can be on. That's important um, because otherwise you end up with a private clubhouse with like a mean sign on the door, and then everyone is sad, and you don't want that. Um, virtual water cooler spaces are pretty important in chat, just because again, if you're you want to bond with team members that are, you know, a 365 hour walk away from you. I don't have a car, so I have to measure things and how long it would take to walk there. I live in the middle of without a car. It's probably fine. Um, but uh, well, we even have um, the uh, sports channel. It's, it's the, draft, the NFL draft was last night, I think. I've been out of it because, was it last night? Yeah, that's right. I was talking to Joe this morning running through my talk and he was like, and I watched like a few hours, you know, like a few minutes of the draft. I fell asleep during pick five and I woke up during pick 12. And I'm like, but what happened? I'm like, I don't know. Um, but uh, we do actually, like, we're, we're, we work on things actively in the chat channels. So, and, you know, cat, like the cat assisting with the deploy to prod is a, an important part of this complete deploy, obviously. Because, um, you know, as my boss said, you need to have two sets of eyes on any kind of office thing. Um, <laughs> and um, it's, it's pretty, I think it's pretty helpful and important to realize that like, even though, yeah, I'm standing here in Minneapolis, this, when, when not at the couch with the cat, I'm at the standing desk, the cat still wants to participate. I don't know, I think I have to buy a cat tree and put it next to the standing desk, it's a problem. Um, but, uh, but I don't feel horribly alone all the time, which is good because kind of like Chris, I'm very, very extroverted and I really like people and I don't want to be horribly alone all the time. And I feel like working remote would be very difficult if I felt horribly isolated all the time. To go to a lot of conferences though so um, but another thing is when I mentioned github before we don't just use it for you know tasks and and um, we don't just use it for pull requests of code we actually keep our tech handbook in there so we have a collaborative culture where this is one of our developers decided that the wording in the tech handbook about what it was like when you take vacation I don't know if you can you read that in the back I don't know if you can read that or not you can okay so the, the wording in the tech handbook about you know, when you would take vacation, clearly it was meant to be tongue-in-cheek, but 
Some employees were feeling self-conscious or unhappy about letting their coworkers down by scheduling a vacation, and one of the developers didn't, you know, go and find out from HR if this would be okay. He just submitted a pull request saying, can we change this? And he got a, looks good to me, from a couple of people, and it went in. So, um, and that doesn't mean, and now I'm painting that rosy picture, and it sounds like we're just like some sort of magical Etsy unicorn, right? I know, there are, there are no unicorns, they're just sparkly horses. Of course. Um, but we're not perfect. And so, like, I, I'm pretty sure this was, I can't remember exactly what happened back in February, but, but I'm pretty sure that this is me subtweeting about something at work that was stressing me out, and also Django Cash Machine, because that's horrible, right? I mean, everybody agrees that that's horrible. But, um, and Astrid Atkinson, who is an a engineering director at Google, she's going to be keynoting at Velocity San Clara, so you should go. She's amazing. But she answered with what, something I thought was really profound, which is software is made of feelings. I mean, like software is made of people. It's, it's, software is our will, like writ, you know, it's our will made manifest to create. I mean, it, it is sort of like magic, and it's very personal. I mean, you, you, can, you can spot plagiarized code a mile away because it, it has a style, just like prose. So, um, it's, I think it's really important to remember that when we're talking about all this tool stuff, we're talking about stuff that people are using and are going to have all the feels about. And this understandings happen. And I got permission from my boss to include this uh, section of DMs from our you know, private messages on Slack, which was the TLDR of this is he put a comment on one of my GitHub pull requests that I took really badly and thought that he was being really unkind to me. And I spent half the day stewing over it which was ridiculous, because as soon as I talked to him, it became obvious that he was not in any way like trying to call me out or be horrible to me. And it's like, if I had taken the, the effort to kind of try to communicate a little more there instead of, and maybe if we had been in the same office, it would have been easier, because he would have seen me going, but maybe not. I mean, people, like cats, can sometimes hide that stuff. So, um, so yeah, so taking, making the effort to communicate about that sort of thing is even more important when you're remote. Uh, but one thing that makes it easier is, and this is this is actually the blameless postmortem link goes exactly where you think it's going to go. Like, you know, it goes. You know exactly where it goes. It goes to the Kodos Craft blog post from like 2012. And um, I didn't tell him to send this out after we had had a site incident. Um, my boss, you know, without me being like drink the DevOps Kool-Aid or whatever, um, just sent an email to the company saying, oh, by the way, just so everyone knows, our incident reports are here, and this is something that you should know about. And I was like, excellent. This is, I, I know that you're not supposed to carve a culture, but there's a few things from Etsy that I'm fine with just lifting full skin, you know? Like, and one of them is, hey, we have to focus on the problem and not on the person. Because people are going to make mistakes. That's, failure is a normal part of complex systems, is also what I would say. So. Um, I haven't said anything about Deming yet, so for those of you who are playing the bingo game, <laughs> um, speaking of work the game, uh, I had a really bad attitude the first quarter because we implemented OKRs and we did them with like a Google spreadsheet and everyone scored them differently and I scored really poorly because we were using a very Boolean sort of method and then other groups were like, we're just going to use smiley faces and we were like, why didn't we do that? And so this time we're actually using a tool from something I think it's called BetterWorks. But the, the tool is not the important part. The important part is that we're making the progress that we're doing for things, especially things other parts of the organization really care about, visible to other parts of the organization. So I don't think it necessarily matters what tool you use for it. But the important part is that if you have goals that you're working towards that you're communicating you know, to the organization about, like they can actually see. So that they, in case they missed it, like or weren't looking at Slack that given day, or Maybe they're not a developer at all, and they're not sure what GitHub is, and they're not sure why a developer would want to be able to create a repo, whatever that is. At least that part of the organization who doesn't know what that stuff is can see that there's stuff happening that's providing better collaboration in one particular area. So that's pretty useful. Um, it also has an app. I haven't installed it. I'm really not sure if I want to gamify work quite that much. But uh, something else that I was thinking about when I was looking at things that would be a good example to show is uh, all of the people sending these work from home emails yesterday um, live in the Philadelphia area and could very well have been going into the Philadelphia office. And because our culture is so remote first and because everything is accessible to you, whether or not you're in the office, 
asterisk except pi, as Melissa was saying. It's like, what? Um, but because everything's accessible to you, whether or not you're in the office, um, even for people who love to go to the office every day and want to work right by where the office is or live by where the office is, there's a lot of benefits to not having to worry about scheduling all these aspects of their lives around some kind of set hours. So it's, that's actually really beneficial for us in terms of our hiring because people who have family situations or wherever they want to live type situations where it becomes a problem, like we've built this into the culture. Um, and something that we've never planned for but it's ended up being incredibly helpful is because one of the people, the, the Pink Panther in this meeting, um, is a developer in Texas who works on the front end team. And because they had already decided to do these meetings as Google Hangouts and have the Pink Panther in the meeting, um, the front end code review is completely accessible to the front end developer that we hired who is deaf or hard of hearing. So if you, you sometimes get benefits from making sure everything is, you know, either in writing or in a recordable form. You get benefits that you don't even dream of because we had no idea when we started working like this that we were going to hire Kimberly. And then we did. We're like, oh, wonderful, a talented front end developer, and she doesn't necessarily need to pay somebody to show up every day. She can use a video relay service for these meetings because the meetings are accessible by default. So, it's it's that's actually a something that we didn't realize would be a benefit that's ended up being really useful for us. Because again, everyone in the room is hiring. We were able to hire her. There may be organizations that would have had a harder time making that accommodation. So, um, another uh, character in this story um, is my coworker, Jin. And Jin is, um, a, he's a kind of, you know, middle of the stack developer who liked his job in New York just fine and hadn't been back to Korea since he was a kid. And when his parents decided to move there, thought, wouldn't this be kind of fun? I get a chance in my 20s to go live in Seoul. Why not? It's, it's basically like moving to the future, right, in terms of tech. So he picked up and moved to Korea. He didn't quit his job. So we have the continuity of Jin still works for us. And the uh, developers on, in his uh, sub team have the amazing, wonderful thing of they wake up in the morning and all of their pull requests have been reviewed. And there's like a whole, you know, he's the pull request fairy, you know, it's like he's 14 hours ahead of, uh, of Eastern time. So it's, you know, every once in a while he'll stay up late for a meeting with us. But other than that, it's like, it's, it's really useful that everything in our technical workflow is still completely accessible to him, even with that kind of time difference. And it's useful for us because, again, we didn't have to replace him when he wanted to move. Um, and there's other people who are, there's one of our developers, uh, he and his boyfriend, well, now fiance, are moving to Washington State because they want to live in Washington State. But he doesn't have to quit his job, which is good because he's an excellent Go programmer. So, um, there, is a, there is a slight downside to deciding deliberately to live reasonably far away from your job, yet wanting to see your coworkers all the time. And it, it pretty much, you can see it in my Fly Delta app, which is, I come out here a lot. I eat a lot of ice cream with Catherine. It's probably fine. But, but it's, it, that some of this is conferences too, but it's basically like you have to make choices and a lot of our coworkers, uh, the, the, the Pink Panther guy down in Texas, um, yeah, Paul in, in Texas, I don't think has come up since he onboarded. And it's like, you don't have to, but it's available. Like it is an option. Um, and my coworker Pete, who lives about an hour out of Philly, and so he goes into the Philly office a little bit more than I do, but not much more. Um, as you can see by the fact that we're, when we're in the Philly office, we actually just stand at the same standing desk because there's really not enough room. Because <laughs> we're not, you know, we don't usually, we don't have desks there. But all of those working from home people, there's usually a desk. And we gave a presentation together, we have a joint presentation at Craft Comp. And unlike Todd and Aaron yesterday, who it's clear that they spend a lot of time together, like Pete and I, or sorry, it wasn't Craft Comp. I'm thinking of Craft Comp because I'm looking at Catherine. Wouldn't that have been awesome if we were in Budapest together? No, um, at Chef Comp. Uh, you can tell by the logo. But so Pete and I gave a presentation together, and we had met, I think, three or four times in person. And um, people couldn't tell, I guess, because we had a bunch of people asking if he was in Minneapolis too. And I'm like, no, we just kind of practicing Google Hangouts, it was fine. <laughs> but I mean, the, having the, um, the ability to actually connect with someone without necessarily being physically next to them is something that 
Well, we have the technology, right? Um, there are some things we don't necessarily have the technology for. As it turns out, the cookies I make are not made out of tuna fish. My cat does not actually like them. I offered them to her. She didn't like them. I sent them to my coworkers, not the same ones that she's trying to eat, but I sent them. <laughs> <laughs> I fed those to my boyfriend. <laughs> but um, if you're watching this video later, Joe. Um, but, uh, you know, every once in a while, yeah, you miss out on the pie or the cookies or whatever. But, you know, we have the mail for that, so it's, it's okay. Um, and... There are, there's one important business tool that I didn't mention before, um, which is uh, the Yahoo Fantasy Sports app is very useful for connecting with design and video and sales and marketing and all of those teams that you maybe would have no reason as an ops engineer to talk to. But if you join the fantasy football team, you will talk to them and possibly defeat them. If that was my winning streak last year. It all went downhill from there. So that's the image I'm going to keep. Um, but I guess what I want to what I want to just end with is if you connect to the people and you care about the people and you care about what you're working on together and your company makes the effort to do things like put Chrome boxes in all of the conference rooms and when you're hiring when you're you know when you're interviewing people make sure the remotes can interview them too do all the interviews with the Google Hangout if they come in in person for the interview in the Chrome box of the conference room. So there's a lot of technical details like that, and different organizations are going to implement that stuff different ways. But I didn't. I deliberately didn't go with a giant checklist of things you have to buy for your conference room because I think that's where companies start to feel like they can't do this. And you don't have to do all of that. Google Hangouts is free, y'all. Like it, you don't have to do all of that in order to do this. Like you just have to have people willing to put everything in a format that's going to be accessible to their remotes. Um, we actually, our vice president of engineering, Ryan Brace, um, moved to like the kind of uh, satellite floor of the Philly office so that, deliberately, so that he would not be where the other managers were. And so then if they had a conversation and he would say, when did that get decided? Oh, well, we were just talking about it. No, you weren't. It's not in a GitHub issue. <laughs> it's like, but you have to have your management choose to make those sort of decisions. But if they're willing to, if they do, um, and if the team members are willing to keep everything as transparent as they can, um, it can work really well. It works really well for us. <coughs> Ground Fever is awesome. Um, we're hiring, and uh, if you weren't at the New York Tech Day when they were handing those out, they probably still have some down at the office. So um, if you want to work with me doing this stuff, it's pretty fun. Uh, if you want to talk more about it, I would love to talk about it. I, I went to a few open spaces at a few DevOps days before deciding to take a, a remote gig. And I think Pittsburgh and maybe Silicon Valley, but definitely at DevOps days Pittsburgh last year. Those are really good uh, open space on remote work. And it's not necessarily whether you're deciding to take a remote gig or whether your company is deciding to bring on remotes, it's not necessarily something to be done lightly, but it can be, I hope I've illustrated that it can be really rewarding and you can get benefits from it that you may not have even seen before. So um, yeah, that's it, that's my pitch. Uh, Okay. Okay. Sorry, the gentleman back here first. Yes. Hi. Uh, Hi. Thanks for addressing this, Bridget. This is uh, like a perennial topic, and mm -hmm. every DevOps day it seems like, and it gives us a nice practical mix. Um, but sometimes there's some real prosaic type issues. Um, mm -hmm. You know, earlier Justin was saying, when you blew up a MacBook accidentally, I tend to like always have two computers on me in case some weird thing happens. You're out um, uh, where you're not in an office, where you can just mm -hmm. go grab another machine from your mm -hmm. office mate. Do you have any like um, extra uh, you know tips for working with the net, keeping that net there in case something odd happens? Like that? Yeah, absolutely. So the the question was, okay, if you're not in an office where there's a supply closet with a spare MacBook Pro, what happens if yours explodes? Um, a couple of things about that. One is we have um, an if you're going to move your computer, you must push your code up to GitHub. It can be in a work in progress branch that um, nobody, you know you can put a do not merge on the PR. Uh, we have a label in every repo that says do not merge, and people do that all the time. But if you don't do that, then you could lose some work when what happens to, um, like my coworker Pete, his second or third week of work, his MacBook Pro just kind of died on him. And he you know, lives an hour outside of Philly and kind of wanted to keep working that day. 
and what uh, he was given the discretion to just go to the Apple store and buy one, or the Apple authorized reseller. They have in Doylestown, Pennsylvania. I don't know. I don't think they have a real Apple store there. It's some kind of off-brand Apple store, but um, but yeah. So I mean, even though we don't have like you know, we do have um, an actual IT person in the New York office to you know deal with that sort of thing. But like for people who are remotes. When I got the Thunderbolt monitor for that standing desk, like I just went to the Apple store and bought it and expensed it. Like we have that kind of, I guess I don't know if that explains it. And, and then in terms of, I do have two laptops because I have one for work, and this one covered in stickers is actually my personal one because it's tiny. I like traveling with a tiny laptop. Um, but I find that that's mostly useful if I want to be like running Test Kitchen on two different branches at the same time. <laughs> like it's uh, it's annoying to do that uh, in terms of like your kitchen.yaml files. And so like I actually do use both of them like to work sometimes. <laughs> but uh, the Docker thing does help in terms of the if you blow up your local, like you can be up and I mean all you need is your AWS keys and you can be up and running again <laughs> very in very short order. I don't know if that answers your question. But. A lot, but I hope you hear more in a great conversation with Okay, uh, Jason. Yeah, so with um, Jen, your, your very cool professor, he, um, do you ever run into problems where he, because of the, the time difference, because he's in a different part of the world, you need some more like synchronous communication and how do you handle, like when he's sleeping, you're working, um, assuming there's some, you know, some way to deal with that? Yeah, so if we want to have synchronous communication with an employee who's, you know, in Seoul, um, he does stay up pretty late. He's kind of a night owl, so we do intersect. I mean, I see him on, on Slack almost every day. So like we do have some, a few hours of intersection. Um, but we also, um, we don't have anything in really long-lived feature branches, and we practice like, you know, trunk-based development. So once uh, he gets something of his, you know, merged in, like if it blows up master, yeah, we might have to revert. But like, it's not gonna blow up prod. So. Um, it is, it, it things, I guess there have been sometimes like a blocker may come into play that we have to wait for, but it's not usually, it's not usually going to affect us either operationally or um, from like a, we're not going to leave the build broken, so if it can't be fixed, it can easily be reverted. If that, does that make sense? Yes? Uh, great talk. Um, what do you, what do you recommend or maybe any tips or advice you have for keeping people who are working remotely sort of yeah, I mean that's that's tough because um, it's oh yeah. So he asked uh, what I recommended in terms of keeping remote workers motivated since they have the flexibility to you know I don't know not work I guess. And um, <laughs> so I think at least from my point of view, if I'm having a day that I'm really feeling down and I feel like I can't be productive, I try to figure out what's wrong. Did I forget to eat? Or have I not seen any humans for like two days? Um, and I try to solve whatever that is that's getting in the way of me wanting to work because I love my job. So I usually want to work on it unless there's something else going on. And my boss is also pretty good about um, like, you know, if I say like, I know we just had our one-on-one, -on -one, but I need to talk. Like, okay, well, he is he works at home two days a week himself. His conference space is always, I, I suppose, it, does anybody work someplace where you have enough conference rooms that conference space is not a problem? <laughs> <laughs> so oh, getting a private room for a conference room sometimes requires him to actually, like, use the kitchen counter as a standing desk in the office. <laughs> so, um, but, or if he's working from home, like, it's much easier, of course. But he's totally taken an employee needs to talk, like, he'll talk to them from the kitchen or from the pantry or from up, you know, the hallway. So, like, you have to, I guess, the manager's point of view is you have to make sure that you're available to your employees when they, need, either when they need you to prod them, which I sometimes need, or when they need to reach out to you. And if they're not reaching out, you still have to pay attention to that. So, yeah. Um, I feel like I'm only taking questions from this side of the room. I'm sorry. So let's look to this side of the room. There's... Okay, I'm going to go with the question all the way back. Sorry, Chris. <laughs> you, sir. Oh, okay. Well, from, from this direction, you're on, you're on the back end. So, uh, I'm, I'm a 100% I'm a telepathy. My entire department is also 100% telepathy, but we are about a third of the entire company. And uh, something that I've noticed is that uh, when people who have not worked remotely try to interact with, Sometimes they think 
the things that are important to us are just kind of like foibles. Like, I mean, we'll say, hey, could you bring up a second computer with a hangout with a camera pointed at the speaker so we can see the speaker rather than <laughs> the slides the entire you know, three hour interview training or whatever it is? Um, and uh, they, they don't necessarily get that. And they think they're just being a little bit just, you know, just you know, what they're, I mean, do you have any uh, suggestions for that? Yeah, I mean, I think some of that is back to the empathy thing. So maybe they should try joining one of those meetings from home and see how they like watching just the slides for three hours and not seeing all the things the speaker is, you know, doing, saying with their, with their, you know, um, body language and their face. Because we do, especially in cases of conflict resolution, we do try to go to the highest bandwidth form of communication possible. Um, and you can't always get on a plane in time to resolve an argument, but you can usually get in a Google Hangout. And if you can't look at the person, it does make it harder. So, and it also does break up the tedium of really long presentations if you can look at a human. Hi, humans. So, um, I think maybe if you can, the people who are adverse to you know making those changes, if you ask them, try the meeting from home yourself, and see what you think. Like they ha they should have the ability to try that, and then maybe they'll find out what it's like. Yeah. Brands of microphones that they work at big conferences. You mean like the, this wireless lab, or you mean something no, else? No, no, like if uh, the, they're having an all-hands meeting and they're most, Oh. You know, we're, 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 um, we're, 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 we're I can, you know, tweet at me later, and I can probably get that information for you, because we do have, I didn't even go into detail about it, but we do have a weekly Monday morning meeting that's the whole company. We did end up having to change it to a Hangout on air, because Google Hangouts has arbitrary and capricious limits to the number of people who can be the little face on the bottom of the screen. Um, but the, uh, but anyway, we have, um, we worked with, uh, our head of product also kind of has a theatrical bent, I guess, and so he runs the, um, like, you know, placing the tape on the floor and setting up the mic so that the, uh, the people who are presenting about their departments can actually be seen as well as her, because otherwise they would be standing up there and you'd be like, their arm is great, but what about the rest of them? Um, All right. Yeah. You have to... And questions here. It's time for lunch. I'm going to start getting hangry. Um, thank you again, Bridget. Thank you.